we have two speakers for you uh, this evening. On my left, uh, our guest speaker is Dr. Amy Butler from the Adam Smith Institute, which is an uh, independent and influential think tank, very much at the cutting edge of uh, the debates on uh, privatization, deregulation. Um, he's going to be speaking first, and, and he's going to be defending capitalism. On my right, from the Socialist Party of Great Britain, we have Richard Hedicar. Um, Richard, again, will be speaking for about 20, 25 minutes, and uh, he will be defending socialism. Oh, right. Okay, we will, the, the, way, the, the running order that we're going to be using tonight, um, Dr. Butler will speak for 20, 25 minutes, Richard will speak for 20, 25 minutes, and then Dr. Butler will again have 10 minutes to respond, and Richard will follow up with a further 10 minutes. When that's complete, we will then take um, questions and comments from the floor. Um, in uh, conformance with the traditions of the party, we will take visitors further. So any party members, if you will, hold back, and I will indicate when, um, when I'm willing to take questions from uh, the members. Uh, after that, we will we'll wind that up about 20 past nine, and then the two speakers will again have 10 minutes each to sum up, and we will, I will bring the proceedings to a close quite firmly at a quarter to 10, because the management have actually asked us to vacate the building by 10 o'clock. We need 10 minutes, 15 minutes just to, to finish off. So that's the, that's the order of the day, and um, I will say no more, but I will hand over to Dr. Nutt. Thank you very much. Uh, well, I've been asked to speak for 20 minutes, and thanks to the uh, capitalist economy, you can get little gadgets that tell you exactly how long you've been speaking for. I think one of these I love the market economy. Um, but firstly, uh, let me thank you very much for uh, inviting me here. Um, I've uh, always been, uh, from a distance, uh, a sort of fan of the uh, Socialist Party, uh, because of your stand, really, uh, I think, against the heavy-handed bureaucratic forms of socialism and authoritarianism. And it's always struck me that you are genuinely interested um, in ideas and argument. And uh, it's called a debate. I think probably the vote at the end will be uh, 51 to 1 or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I'm not sure we're going to change each other's mind. But at least um, I hope that I might understand a little bit more of your thinking. And I hope that uh, uh, if I have any skill at all, perhaps I can um, uh, introduce you to a, a few of uh, our arguments. But I'm actually here, I'm in, in fact a complete fraud, uh, because I always thought of myself actually as something of a socialist, uh, that I am very much against uh, privilege um, and class and wide uh, disparity uh, in income and wealth. Um, and I think, that like Adam Smith, um, the reason that I believe in uh, a market capitalist economy is because I think it is the best way uh, of helping fundamentally the working poor. Uh, and uh, I, I think that if you uh, look at the way that uh, capitalism has spread through the world, it is the people at the very bottom who have benefited most from it. And those actually are the people that I'm interested in. I'm not in this for the boss classes. I'm not in it because I went to a private school. I didn't, or I had a uh, silver spoon background because I didn't. Um, or even that, you know, I think that um, I'm, I'm going to become a, a billionaire and, and boss everybody else around because I know I'm not. You can't do that in the sort of think tank business. Um, so I, th I think that we will find that our ideals are actually quite similar. Uh, it is just, I think, the means that we probably disagree on. Um, so I welcome this opportunity. Um, I think I'm going to make, if I've got time, I'll, I'll make uh, four points. Firstly, I think that a system, a uh, socialist system, which um, involves people voting as to how society should proceed and what it should do. I don't think that is any better than the profit system. I, I think it's open to the same kinds of human frailties. Uh, secondly, uh, I would like to argue that the exchange system, which is fundamental to capitalism, uh, the system of exchange for profit, benefits both sides. It benefits everybody. It doesn't just benefit some minority um, of providers who are uh, reap financial profit. It's much broader than that. Um, thirdly, I'd like to say that the market system uh, is better at dealing with change. We live in a world of change, we're talking about climate change and different what else. Things do change. 
And I think that one of the reasons I support the capitalist system is because I think that it deals with that uh, very much better. Uh, and the fourth thing, uh, if I have time, is simply to say uh, that the system that I'm arguing for does actually seem to work. And I think that it works better. So on the first point about how you actually decide what is going to be done, uh, well, you've got two possible systems. We'll sit down and we vote and we decide uh, what's going to, going to happen. Um, or we have a system which is driven uh, by trade and commerce and indeed by profit. Well, you know, it seems to me that uh, the, the vote motive is just as corrupt, if you like, as the profit motive. Um, in, in political society, I'm just reading the headlines today in Evening Standard, you know, MPs have to pay back a million pounds or something. It's, it is, it's a corrosive system. People enter it because they want power. Yes, I know, you're all good people and you would like to have a system where good people come in uh, and decide how society is going to be run. But uh, what happens is, of course, that power attracts people who don't think that at all. People who are in it for themselves. I just come back uh, the other day from Moscow, and uh, really, the people in public office there uh, seem to think, politicians as well, seem to think that the reason that they're in public office is to line their own pockets, not to actually help society. The whole thing is corrupt. And I think that if you have a market economy, you actually undermine that, uh, that corruption, uh, that, that, that power motive. I think it gives people an alternative. If everything is decided by some Politburo, uh, well, you know, we don't have any options. But, you know, MPs can decide what they want, but in a market economy, actually it's ordinary individuals who decide <coughs> lots of other things for themselves. So it's a balance of power, which I think is important. I'm against concentrated power. I think it's wicked and evil. I want to see restraints on people's power. And I think that the market economy actually gives a lot of power to ordinary people uh, rather than to uh, big fat cats or powerful politicians. Uh, because it's driven by people's choices. It's what you and I decide to buy that decides what's actually going to be produced. And if we don't buy things, then they don't get produced because there's no profit in them. So I think that the um, the vote system is, is no better in human terms than the profit system, and, and I think it's probably actually uh, slightly worse because of that concentration of power. <coughs> Secondly, uh, I want to explain how I see the system of exchange for profit. Exchange makes people better off. They wouldn't do it if they didn't feel that they were better off. It makes both sides better. We get confused in an economy where uh, we have money because we think, oh well, whoever's getting the cash is better off. But cash is just a medium of exchange. It's just something that you accept temporarily uh, because you know that you can use it to exchange for something that you really want later. Uh, it's only a medium. Uh, so I think you should look beyond financial benefit. Um, exchange is one of the most natural things in the world. You know, kids this high will swap toys, right? You get fed up with a toy, you get another kid, you swap the toy, you're better off, and the other kid's better off. Both of you have benefited from the exchange, and you wouldn't do it if you didn't benefit from the exchange. Now, when you've got that happening all over the place, millions of people, billions of people indeed around the planet, all exchanging, all benefiting from it, all getting something they want, that they prefer, and giving up something that they don't want quite so much, uh, but that somebody else does want, that spreads benefit throughout the planet. It doesn't matter whether money is involved or not. Both sides benefit from that deal, and they gain something which they value. Uh, and uh, this system also, it, you know, it benefits, it spreads benefits, human benefits far and wide and very fast as well. Um, and uh, it encourages people, of course, to grow their capital, uh, to husband their resources, uh, to create capital which can produce uh, goods and indeed services more cheaply and more effectively at a higher uh, standard. Uh, it encourages those motives. Uh, and I think, therefore, uh, it's given us, it's given the world better and cheaper products. Uh, and uh, therefore, I think it's to be supported. The third argument I want to make is that um, 
I think the, the market system, the capitalist system, is uh, more adroit than uh, one which depends on political planning or, or votes on how we should do things. Again, we live in a world of constant change. Things happen all the time. Stuff just happens. Uh, and in the market economy, it is prices which steer resources, and they do that very rapidly, very quickly. Um, they do it in response to what's happening in uh, local places, just from time to time, from minute to minute. Um, you can think of something like, I don't know, an estate agent or a taxi firm. An estate agent has to know what we supply and demand as different properties are uh, in the locality. Um, not just from five-year plan to five-year plan, or even from year to year, or even from month to month, but from week to week and day to day. They've got to know uh, what properties people want to buy and what properties are coming on sale. And, and, and the other local problems, like whether there's going to be a road or a planning blight or, or whatever. They've got to know that. A taxi company has to know where passengers are and uh, what they'll pay and where they want to go, uh, not just from day to day, but from minute to minute. The market system, the capitalist system, is incredibly rapid at dealing uh, with changes like that. Circumstances, it can, it can uh, deal with those and, and make sure that the goods or the services are provided at the right place at the right time. By the time, you know, if we tried to do this by some sort of central planning system, uh, and uh, we had a computer up in Whitehall or something, uh, and you were an estate agent and you had to feed all your information up to Whitehall, uh, and then it all got number crunched up there and it all came back down again. By the time it had done that, the customers would have gone. I mean, they'd have gone abroad or they bought, bought something somewhere else. You know, they were, uh, and, and your taxi customers would certainly have gone. But you, you can't possibly process the information that you need uh, to satisfy people's changing needs and desires uh, by having a central planning system. Uh, it's an information problem. And, and, of course, you've got to remember that information isn't cut and dry. Information exists there. It exists in people's mind. It's partial. It's local. It's changing. There may even be disagreements about what the information actually is, what is actually happening. And the market system uh, works that out with amazing alacrity and speed. Uh, and much more so, I think, than you can get from a central planning system. So there we are. I think that it's. Uh, I, I think the, the the system doesn't rely on uh, concentrated power. Uh, I think that exchange leaves both sides better off. Uh, I believe that the market handles information much better. And I think also the fourth point that I would like to make is that I do think it works. Now I know that when we're discussing this subject, it's very important that we should. Uh, talk either about theory or about reality. And I'm prepared to, to discuss either of those. What I'm not prepared to do is to, to discuss, is to compare you know, your theory with my reality uh, and, and vice versa. I think we can say, right, let's look at capitalist societies, America, Britain, uh, New Zealand, Australia, wherever you like. Um, aren't they better societies than socialism has produced over the years? Uh, and I think, you know, when you do actually look around the world, I think they are better societies, and they have done much better for the ordinary individuals, and particularly the individuals at the bottom end. Uh, so I think on a practical level, I'm very happy to argue that, and I think that um, uh, <coughs> capitalism has actually benefited the world uh, hugely. Uh, but at the same time, you know, I do believe that it has these theoretical uh, benefits, advantages, which I've been talking about. So we can discuss either, but you know, you can't compare somebody's sort of perfect idea of what a society should be, mine or yours, with how it actually turns out, because these things all, always get corrupted by politics and culture and you know, who knows what. But it does seem to me that uh, one of the reasons, one of the strongest reasons, I think, to support a capitalist system is that in recent years, in the last, what, 20, well, 30 years, I mean, it's taken how many billion people out of poverty, out of abject poverty? Uh, it, is, it is their integration into the 
market economies of the world trade system, which has improved the lives of a billion people in India and half a billion people going on a billion when they get around to finishing it in, in China. It wasn't social, it wasn't Mao that produced that. It wasn't even socialism that did that. In fact, that held them back. But just in recent years, certainly in, in the, since the Berlin War came down, just in those recent years, billions of people have moved up from a dollar a day. Now, I think that's actually a good thing, and I think we need to have more of it. And I think this is a powerful engine of growth uh, and uh, uh, a human benefit, which we should actually all appreciate. Uh, the world's living standards have doubled since 1970. I think that's a good thing. I think people, I like to see people living better than they did last year and the year before, and better than my granny did. Uh, and you know, we live at a standard today, we take it for granted. We live at a standard which you know, a medieval prince or princess would have dreamed of. Uh, but we take things for granted, hot and cold, running water, and all, and all the rest. And it is the capitalist system which has produced all of those things. It is the capitalist system which has given us the wealth uh, to, to look after our poor, to create welfare systems. Uh, I, I think that it's a very positive human system. And I don't think you should knock it. So I think that's really, I won't go on any further. <laughs> I guess I've covered the main arguments, we can come back to them later. Um, but I, I think it's a system that works, I think it works better. I think if you look around the, the world of capitalist and socialist societies, I think it clearly works better. But I think also, on a theoretical level, uh, I, I think that it captures human motives better. I, I, I think the exchange system, the desire of every person to better, better their condition and to do it through exchange and by building up their capital and producing uh, better and cheaper goods. Uh, these, these are things to be uh, encouraged. And I think that it is uh, more adroit at uh, dealing with change. Uh, and uh, that's really the reason why I believe it.
oppressive system. What socialists propose is a world without markets, without money, without wages, without state or leaders, a truly classless society. The Oxford Dictionary says of us, a political and economic theory of social organization which advocates the means of production, distribution, and exchange uh, should be regulated or owned by the whole community. If you remove the word exchange and substitute and for or, it gives us a reasonable starting point. Owned by the community as a whole, what a lovely phrase. It describes the very basis of socialism. Our term for it is common ownership and is the core to our case. The idea is anathema to capitalists and their uh, usual response is to dismiss it, um, a little as Amon did slightly, as hopelessly impractical or at best the fanciful notion of naive dreamers at worst. Actually I have worse than that say, but never mind. Yet for our distant ancestors, producing and sharing together was a normal way of life. Why on earth is it considered practical, sensible, or reasonable that our common inheritances, land, minerals, crops, the bountiful produce of nature, and all the resources of the earth should all be hijacked in the interest of privileged minorities? Is it practical, sensible, or reasonable that light, warmth, food, water, medicines, and shelter produced from these resources, the basic necessities of life, the things we all need to survive, or desire to make life more pleasurable, are produced primarily, and some might say only, for profit? And that in order to make that profit, the vast majority of these, uh, those inhabiting our planet must needs be exploited, often degraded, frequently cheated, and alas, sometimes literally worked to death. Is it practical, sensible, or reasonable that as a direct consequence of the profit motive, so-called surplus food and crops are destroyed? life-saving medicines and vitamins are deliberately underproduced, or that every uh, empty home in London should be boarded up and left uh, unoccupied. It's not right, is it? It isn't practical or reasonable or sensible. Nor is it practical, reasonably, reasonable or sensible that millions of unconsidered human beings should be left to live or die in misery and squalor, while others prosper. Earthquakes, tsunamis, and other major catastrophes never fail to elicit a generous and warm response from people all the world over. But routine tragedies, terrible sufferings, every day, every moment that we live, affect far more people than those catastrophes, and they remain unnoticed. But that, I'm afraid, is the harsh reality of good old, oh so practical and efficient capitalism. <clears throat> Astonishingly, a system still resignedly accepted by the very people struggling within it, trapped by an assiduously reinforced mindset of a seriously flawed assumption. Common ownership is common sense <coughs> and the only possible foundation for another fundamental principle of socialism <coughs> that production should be only for use and not profit. <coughs> the plain fact is that whatever <coughs> the theoretical differences between the various key players on the monopoly board of capitalism. Profit is the medium that binds them all together. The theoretical evocation. The vigorous pursuit of profit is sometimes considered to be both necessary 
and desirable and even virtuous by capitalists. Maximizing profits means that ten times as many workers are employed in selling rather than producing. And production for profit leads to gross waste and inefficient use of resources. And it also makes people ill. A virulent disease, far more widespread and deadly than swine flu, is the profit imperative panic syndrome. Middle managers and above in both private and public services are particularly susceptible to it. Under pressure from their bosses to produce an annual profit, or at least a drastically reduced loss, while increasingly constrained by ever-diminishing budgets, they opt to work beyond their agreed hours without pay. What Upton Sinclair called giving the bosses time for the church. <laughs> Last year, five million employees worked seven hours a week for nothing. Calculated as a 27 billion pound gift to the employers, far exceeding the so-called strikes. Work-related stress, this is a fact, is the third leading cause of death in young men. Why should we be surprised? Long hours, no wages, no security, even a permanent contract may only be six months. A chain of ownership under the Thatcher legislation frequent results and revised almost invariably worse condition of employment and lower pay. Six month contract, 40 year mortgage, job insecurity, mounting debts. It's not rocket science, is it? Why people get stressed. The earliest example of writing which was discovered in Babylon, was about debt, believe it or not. And in 1996, Lifetime Television received the Cable Ace Award for the best game show ever. It was called Debt. <laughs> and it was completely humiliating. I'm not going to tell you how it was too sad. If you want to know afterwards, I'll describe it to you. <coughs> the profit imperative panic syndrome encourages exactly the kind of reckless behaviour we've recently seen from the banks. Though how institutions that charge £35 for a letter, £40 for a represented cheque, that charges interest on charges, charges you for paying in and charging you for taking money out could ever make a loss is a miracle of itself. <laughs> Some years ago, I discovered a single UK bank spent more than three million pounds on paper alone. More recently, I had occasion, very rarely I assure you, to visit a bank to change an address. It took the computer only five seconds to print out three forms in paper for me to fill in. Ridiculous. Businesses are adopting increasingly crazy ideas in their attempts to cut running costs. A favourite one at the moment is saving labour costs by sacking workers who perform their jobs well and replacing them at much lower wages by those who cannot do them at all. <laughs> Inefficiency in the harnessing of resources, appalling waste, environmental damage and callousness, and uncaring attitudes of so many workers. The real producers, the workers, are all consequences of producing for profit. But as long as money brings with it power and privilege, to those individuals and conglomerates who elect to exploit others, as it invariably does, millions of human beings will remain shackled to poverty, hunger, and misery. That is why 
A socialist society must be a moneyless society. And even people who are receptive to propositions of common ownership and production for use find the idea of the absence of money difficult to assimilate. Most consider money a constant, an ever-present, a necessity that is an indispensable fact of life. A perfectly understandable response, given the confined and so carefully constructed and preserved parameters in which the most discussion about it occurs. In their publication, Looking to the Millennium, the Earth Center predicted three things that would abide, man, nature, and money. Obviously, it is not possible simply to decide to abolish money as an isolated act. Its demise would be a byproduct of socialism, the logical consequence of common ownership and production for use. We should not be shocked that the Earth Center included money as a component of its holy trinity, for it's an all-pervasive, relentlessly intrusive, often overwhelming reality from our toys onwards. And I'm not sure that when I exchanged toys, I was always better off than the collapses who did it with me. <laughs> the corrupting nature of that reality was succinctly stated by the American writer Logan Pierce Smith, who wrote, those who set out to serve God and man soon realize that there is no God. Oh, in a world with a fantastic productive capacity and astonishing technology, technological advances, millions are denied the most basic provision simply for lack of money. Now only a blinkered nincompoop would deny that the productive and technological development that resulted from industrial capitalism, albeit at a cost of a, a profound cost for humans, uh, was not helpful in reaching our present position. Indeed, these developments are precisely what made the worldwide cooperation and possible. Today, we can communicate anywhere. Before industrial development took us to this point, perhaps socialism was a dream. But now, internationally, we can communicate, we can cooperate, and we've seen that cooperation in so many instances where there have been disasters. At the same time, market economics and the dominant role of money have perpetuated the separation, widened the division between the haves and the have-nots. Only last week we heard that the gap between those who have and those who don't have in this country is wider than it's ever been since the Second World War. <clears throat> in some cases, that difference is so great that it is difficult to grasp without a, a graphic illustration. Now, some of you here will know what my favorite one is. It concerns the Duke of Westminster. And I swear I'm never gonna use it again, but I'm gonna use it tonight because it's worth hearing. It still staggers me every time I hear it. I'm now against the Duke of Westminster. Paul Accounts is a very nice bloke. He paid his workers poll tax, and he drinks good whiskey like I do. <laughs> Nothing against him, although his whiskey isn't better than mine for his money. But when he was 29 in the 70s, he inherited his uh, family wealth. 29. Now at that time, there was a steel workers' strike, and the Daily Telegraph described them as so called low paid steel workers at £100 a week. Well, of course, the truth was to get £100 a week, they had to work this this time for the church in order to boost their wages. But anyway, assuming that it was £100 a week, I'm indebted to the late, very funny Keith Waterhouse for pointing this out in the first place, which I verified on my computer. For steel workers at £100 a week to have earned the 29-year-old Duke of Westminster's inheritance. They would have had to start work 
25,000 years before. Oh, no, no, wait, wait, I'm not finished. 25,000 years before the emergence of the animal man. <laughs> but perhaps another gap is between those of us who live on our pensions and those who can spend 2,000 275 pounds on a Louis Vuitton handbag. Are there any here tonight? I don't want to offend anyone. <laughs> I think 12,000 was on this <laughs> The technological development resulted from industrial capitalism, as I said. And it wasn't the profound human cost. But it helped us detect where we are and make our vision a possibility. In a legalist, democratic, controlled society, and it will be legalist, and save us, please, from, from revolutionary elitist vanguards, no matter how conscientiously, how established, um, um, how successful the functioning of a regulatory mechanism, democracy, even in such a society, and it will be a democratic society, could not function as a mechanism that stands alone. It requires the active, informed participation, the unhampered and comprehensive uh, dissemination of information, the absolute right to express uncoerced opinions, sensitive consideration for minority positions, and crucially, it's its very essence of principled, gracious conciliation pervading the interaction between those in the community. Unless democracy and the democratic spirit is reflected in our personal attitudes, thoroughly integrated into our lifestyle, philosophy or ethic, call it what you will, it will be unable to function effectively as an acceptable arbiter of social disputes without the resort to some overriding authority. The proper practice of democracy is never easy, and learning to get it right, or as right as possible, requires and will require time and practice. It is a deep learning experience for free and therefore potentially awkward individuals. But whatever its complexities, socialism and democracy are indivisible. So it's common ownership, production for use, true democracy, but no leaders. And sadly, the idea that homo sapiens could coexist harmoniously without any kind of leaders or government, not to be confused with the essential administration of things, <clears throat> is also dismissed as almost impossible. And I was finished on this. I see I've got a few minutes. So many have had the confidence and self-belief seriously undermined by the authoritarian and exploitative system in which we live, that they seek security in conformity. A few make decisions and the rest are required to obey. Drawn into this comforting and dangerous illusion, the vast majority choose not to question the situation too strenuously. In their anxiety not to be seen as different or difficult, Imbued with a genuine concern about losing their jobs, they substantially suppress the shared human capacity to be free, discriminating, sympathetic, cooperative, but dynamic human beings. Those who do not conform are quickly labelled cranks, troublemakers, rebels, freaks or fools, or in my case, a senile or fool. Instead, they remain the generally nice, kind, malleable citizen, so beloved of politicians and leaders. The vast amounts of information directly affecting our lives, sometimes dramatically so, is kept secret because our leaders think they know best. I've got to finish in a few moments, but I want to tell you this little story, another true story, about the way in which some people give absolute unquestioning devotion to their leaders, even in this day and age. A few electric
elections ago, when I was working in Lewisham, I went across to the Labour Party office. And there I saw the Labour Party woman worker, activist. And when I pointed out one or two of their broken promises and a few of their double dealings, she said, ah, yeah, that's what they all say, but that was before. Now, she said, now we've got Tony Blair. <laughs> All that has before. Now we've got Tony Blair. Oh, might say, I say, what does he believe then? <laughs> ah, well, that's what I'm waiting to find out. <laughs> but we have got one. We have got uh, one member, one vote, and those of us with long memories doubtless recall the Machiavellian reasons for that. Um, particular decision. And here's a clue. It was not in the interests of Labour Party democracy. Anyway, I've got to shut, shut up now. I've got um, um, a few more things to say, but I won't. All I will say to end is that human beings possess amazing potential, and it can only truly be reached by embracing the stunning, exciting principle of common ownership and an ungoverned society of free, independent, cooperative inhabitants. And that is what socialists stand for. Okay, just to remind you of the, the running order, uh, George Butler is now going to take 10 or so minutes to uh, respond, and then Richard will take about 10 minutes. Uh, thank you very much. Um, Richard, I respect you very much, but I, I have to say I was slightly disappointed there because I think uh, much of what you were saying was a caricature um, of the reality and indeed of my own position. And I think that you were falling into the error which I said at the beginning I hoped we wouldn't fall into. Sorry, am I not talking loud enough? Just to say, say it wrong. Um, uh, which I hope we wouldn't fall into, of comparing our own uh, bright theory with the other person's uh, reality. And, and I feel that you were doing that. We were having a, we, we found a, you know, a lot of uh, upbeat talk uh, about uh, the socialist society we should have in mind and how liberating and, um, that, will, that will be, compared to, well, the Duke of Westminster is not right now. The Duke of Westminster is lost in history and there's a, ages of law and all the rest of it, which contributes to that man being so fabulously wealthy, uh, in, my, in my judgment, rather unjustly. Uh, but, uh, you know, so you, you can't do that. You can't compare a theory on one side and, and the practice on the other. I'm, I'm very willing to argue either, but you, you can't argue one against the other. But you made so many points, I don't, I don't know how many I can get through in 10 minutes. Uh, I counted about 15 or 16 different points there. Uh, and and, and I, some of them I would like to, to address. Um, I mean, you started by saying that the capitalist system you felt was oppressive. Now, in some ways, people say that, and they think they're big businesses, and they control everything and all the rest of it. The opposite is true, or certainly the opposite ought to be true, if we have, have a proper capitalist system which is based on open competition. Because in a competitive environment, uh, what gets produced is what people want. It is, it is what the customers want. If you produce something and nobody wants to buy it, well, you haven't made a profit. So you know, forget about the profit motive. <laughs> you failed. Uh, consumers are sovereign. Now, in the real world, yeah, you're absolutely right. I see that. Yes, I know what you're saying. In the real world, of course, um, you mentioned banking. The consumers definitely aren't sovereign. And why is that? Because there's so much bloody regulation on banks. They're regulated to within an inch of their lives. They're regulated as to you know, how long they can let the phone ring before they can pick it up, literally. Uh, and, that, and regulation is expensive. And that means that new entrants can't come into that market. New banks, it's very difficult to open up a new bank. It costs something like, some bank is telling me 30 million quid to get a, a banking license in this country, because that's all the amount of hoops that you've got to go through. And then you've got to have all your compliance people to make sure that you tick all the boxes. 
which means that, of course, you don't get enough competition. You don't get enough new people coming in with new ideas and new ways of doing things, better ways of doing things, uh, so that customers have a real choice. Uh, and in the banking crisis just recently, the government merged banks and forced banks to merge, so we've got even fewer banks. You know, we need more. <laughs> and, uh, and we need more of many other industries as well. One can think of um, utilities and so on. There isn't enough competition in them. And if you have a market as, as I envisage, then you would have much more competition and consumers would genuinely be uh, sovereign because if they didn't like what they're getting from one supplier, they can go to another. And the first supplier will go bust, and the second supplier will pick up uh, and those, and jobs, those jobs and that profit. And that will steer resources to where people actually want them to go. So I don't think it's an oppressive system, at least I don't think it should be an oppressive system. I can see that, you know, if you're talking reality, I can talk reality of your system, but if you're talking reality, yes, we've got a long way to go before we produce, you know, my ideal of a capitalist system, which would be very open and competitive. I'm very worried about the idea, your second sort of point, about common ownership, because I think, I think this is, again, uh, I do think it's quite good. I think that people husband their own resources. If you own something, you look after it. Um, if you are just part of a big collective, well, maybe you don't. You know, and one thinks of the collective farms and all the rest of it, absolute failure. Uh, and, and even though some American friend of mine was telling me, why do, why do Americans celebrate Thanksgiving every year in November? Uh, they went, the pilgrims went to America and they did indeed practice communal ownership. And they had two extremely bad harvests. And then they thought, right, well, they'll plan for himself. Uh, and uh, so people did actually plant and reap the success uh, of their hard work and energy. Uh, and then they had a monster harvest, and so they shared it with the Indians, and it was absolutely great. And they've done it ever since. Uh, people will look after their own resources and protect them, and that's exactly what you want to do. You want people building up capital so that it makes goods and services more cheaply and more effectively at a, at a better standard. And I think you, know, you can say, oh, all right, well, back in the Stone Age, people used to share, and there was no, no problem about it, and they wanted to do it now. But, it's a method, isn't it? You know, you're looking back at a different society. The fact is, <laughs> we have a, a world of billions of people. You can easily work out a sharing system with, with a small group. And everybody knows what they're doing and what, what their, their role is, and they share resources and all the rest of it. But it has to be a small group. I mean, they always say, you know, Jesus had 12 disciples, and that proved to be one too many. Uh, because once you get larger, you don't know each other. And you know, with this big, we don't really know each other. We don't, you know, can you trust people if people are cheating? Well, you know, you can't just say, oh, no, we'll cheat in the socialist paradise. People won't cheat. Ah. Tell us how. Well, I mean, what I'm saying is if, if collecting resources for, for themselves, secretly perhaps. But um, you're, you're, faced, you're faced with that problem. The larger the society is, then the less you know of people. And that's the magic of the market economy, is that, I mean, look, what am I wearing? I don't know, I'm wearing shoes of leather probably come from Argentina, I'm wearing uh, socks made of cotton that might come from Egypt. I don't know people in Egypt, I don't know people in Argentina, and yet the system gets those resources to me. It's a massive global cooperation system. It just happens to be done through the medium of exchange of money, and, and, and through profit and, and through interpersonal exchange. Um, I don't want to go into things like, oh well, capitalist system leaves flats boarded up and supermarket food. Uh, that just, you know, that isn't true because what is the problem there is things like planning laws, it is the democratic system which is corrupt and frequent in most countries which produce those kind of things. Uh, no property owner can afford in a, in a properly, properly competitive environment uh, to, to leave it idle and unused. Uh, the whole point of it is that in a competitive world, you have to use resources more efficiently because if you don't, somebody else will come up and use other resources more efficiently and will get the trade that you want. And I look at, um, uh, on, on another point you, you made, uh, you know, you're talking about capitalism being grasping and all the rest of it. Uh, fine. 
But at the same time, and look at the volume of philanthropy which comes out of capitalist societies. Uh, you know, Gates, Bill Gates is putting out the bill how many millions or billions, I don't know how much it is, to do things like uh, rid the world of malaria, which is one of the most useful things you can do. You know, you're talking about stress, but you know, people are actually dying in their millions or incapacitated in their millions. So they can't work in, in Africa and other countries. And here you have uh, philanthropy is going to solve that problem. And the wealth that you get from the capitalist system is where you get the resource to do that. <coughs> so, uh, and again, you talk about production for use and not for profit. Well, as Adam Smith said, you know, the, the whole point of production is consumption. Uh, that people only produce things to be consumed. And, and it is because people want to consume goods and services that other people produce them. So, you know, I, I think that's a caricature of the system. Um, so much more, I don't know quite <laughs> where, where, to, where to start and stop. Um, one of the things which I, I do think I, I would like to uh, raise an objection to it's this idea that, well, capitalism is inefficient because it spends so much uh, time on marketing uh, and you've got all these salespeople and in a socialist society you wouldn't need that, uh, there'd be far fewer few, you know, range of goods, you wouldn't have to uh, try and sell your one and all the rest of it. We make progress by differentiation. We make progress by different people doing different things and then we decide, well, which of these do we think is better? You've got stuck in this um, this idea of, of a perfect market. That, you know, the perfect market where there's a graph goes that one, a graph goes that one, and there's a price and a quantity. Uh, and the assumption behind that is that all goods and services are the same, all buyers and sellers are the same, everything is is uniform. The exact opposite is true in the market. You go into a market anywhere here, like selling fruit or whatever, and there'll be different stalls. And different people will have slightly different offerings. And the bananas might be greener or blacker, and then strawberries might be bigger or smaller, uh, and the mangoes, you know. Uh, and people are actually giving you very different products, and you decide between them. You say, well, these, these apples look much better than a chap down there, and I'll buy those. And that's how we make progress, because we're all, it's, it's an evolutionary system that people are always coming up with new ideas and new, new ways of doing things. Uh, and then uh, they can uh, pick people and decide between them, and, and they decide what they think is best, and then people produce more of that. And then there are little gradations in that one, and people produce more of that. And that's how you make progress. You don't make progress by trying to make everything uniform, and I think that's the, the mistake there, that capitalism isn't actually inefficient. It's not inefficient to have a wide variety, you know, 101 different kinds of car or typewriter, or mobile phone, or whatever. Uh, it's extremely efficient, because you learn and you progress from that. <coughs> and, uh, you know, I've said about banks being uh, uncompetitive, I've told you why that is. Money, I don't get hung up with money. Money is just a medium of exchange. We do exchange things, it is natural that we should exchange things. And um, we, uh, we can't, or, you, you know, if you've got a hungry, Barber, that person can't always find a baker who needs a haircut. So what you do is you, ex you exchange something else, you exchange cash, which you know is no use for anything much except as a medium of exchange. And that means that <coughs> later on you can take that medium of exchange and get your haircut bought or buy your bread. That's all it is. It is just another good. There's nothing special or magical about it. There's nothing to fear and fear about it. All it is, it's something like glass, except it's something which everybody will, will take. The point about money is that everybody accepts it in exchange. So it's a medium of exchange. It doesn't do anything itself. Um, what is it is, well, I just want to say, you know, I have the same vision, actually, that, that you do. And, and I think, you know, I would like to see a world in which uh, there are indeed competitive markets where people can enter markets and exit from markets and that there is minimal regulation on those markets. There are 
politicians